Well, last week we started with the Revolutionary War Records Part 1. Now we're going to go on to Part 2. We'll get back to Diane Richard and about the Revolutionary War Records here in just a moment. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further faster and factually with your family research. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time I upload a video. Don't forget there is a website, a newsletter, and a Facebook page. Links for all of that are in the show notes below. If you like the videos here, consider becoming a channel member. You'll get early access to videos and extra perks, all while supporting Genealogy TV, and we really do appreciate it. To learn more about Genealogy TV channel membership, uh, you can click the Join button right next to the Subscribe button. All right, for those who missed part one, I will put a flag up on the screen for you now uh, and in the show notes as well. Diane Richard is a professional genealogist out of the Raleigh, North Carolina area. She is the owner of Mosaic RPM and has put together a handout for this. So stick around and we'll tell you how to download that free handout a little bit later on. So now back to the conversation with Diane Richard. So uh, for the Daughters of the American Revolution or the DAR, uh, what I'm focusing on are the resources that it has available. You obviously have the DAR the Sons of the American Revolution and other lineage organizations that are based on service related to the Revolutionary War. And the DAR just has some great resources available on it that I wanted to share with you that to help you learn more about your ancestors and their service. And one of these is what's called the DAR Genealogical Research System. And if it's abbreviated um, GRS. So I have a tendency to just search on DAR GRS and it will typically bring you to this page. So this is the landing page. I do recommend just looking at the tutorial about it. It will just help explain to you how to search through it. And what you're doing is basically searching the information that has been provided to them in the course of their members joining. So what you're accessing are the lineages that are included in applications, and then you are provided with the opportunity to purchase a, an application or the supporting paperwork that's been provided. And the reason that this is so valuable I frequently run into the situation where we know from research on a lineage that we think there's been family Bibles or that somebody served. Nobody can find the family Bible. We can find the evidence of the service. And somebody's older application might have that Bible in it. So you can get a copy of that family Bible to support your lineage. And Great, you might not too. find that anyplace else. Nice. Because it may not, it, it may not, I mean, I have tracked Bibles that do not exist in the real world anymore. They are, they've been lost by the family. Wow, great tip. So, um, so I use that for these reasons that one, it helps me quickly see if a patriot, if an ancestor could be a patriot. But more importantly, I actually like to try to see if it has unique documentation. Um, and so that's, and I'll just show you, it's a very simple search screen. So you're literally gonna put your ancestor's name in it and then really important a state of service, if you know state of service, because mm -hmm. obviously you just want to focus the results on where you're looking. You don't wanna get a thousand ancestors that are named Bill Smith. You know, you wanna get the ancestors that are for your area and you can add more information, but my rule of thumb is I always try to start skinny unless I get a lot of results. Cause I'd, I'd rather personally look through the list than have, assume something didn't get miscoded somewhere along the way. So well, uh, very only, simple to use. Not only that, but you've got states that change borders, right? Over time. So if you have an ancestor, you know, in Virginia, <laughs> And, and the thing is, right, and you may also believe they served in one state, but it may be a case where they died in one state and you did not realize they had actually served in a different state. Because, you know, you're working backwards on your lineage and you may not have gotten to the point of realizing, oh, wait a minute, he died in North Carolina but he actually served in Virginia and then moved to North, or he's in Texas and had served in Virginia. Do you know that yet? 
you know, had you really pursued that? So that's why I kind of just start really with name. Um, and now what can be helpful is if you happen to know the spouse's first name, that is often the first other thing I'll put in because then you can go, okay, Joe Smith with a wife, Mary, that's going to help narrow the results that we get. Um, but I won't put in a last name to start, you know, again, and if I only get three results, then that's, I've done well. If I get a thousand results, well, then you just have to keep nibbling away at it, right? So. Good job. Nice. And there's one other thing from the DAR. So this is their main thing. This is um, the big, huge database. They created quite a few years now. And, and more recently is the availability of copies of the applications and copies of the supporting documentation. And those are all at a fee and that video is all about accessing those. But there's also this other page I want to point out, which is called Revolutionary War Records. And you can see it's a tab off the main page that says Rev War. There's also a Bibles collection, which has its relevance also. But if we look at the Rev War one, one thing I want to point out is there's a Forgotten Patriots Research Guide. This is a publication that was created to identify African American and American Indian patriots in the Revolutionary War. It was first published as a print volume that was about this thick. And then what they did is created a database of it online. So that's just great because instead of having to purchase the book or getting access to the book, you can now look at it online. They also have this Revolutionary War Pension Index that they created and then a Patriots Records Project Index. And part of the other thing to recognize is that DAR chapters across the country, often starting with the WPA and coming to modern times, have painstakingly put in a lot of time to abstract records. And what the DAR has been doing, it has been trying to digitize those because these were, imagine, remember the old onion skin typing paper? Back in the day, I hate to age both of us a little bit, but uh, we oh, would sure. have typed. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure we both typed on that paper. And a lot of these publications, they literally exist as one typed book in a library someplace, typed on onion skin paper. And so the DAR chapters have been working to start trying to digitize some of those because people went through and indexed records and abstracted them. But given that they're in one print book on onion skin paper, that wasn't giving great access to researchers. Um, so the DAR is continuing to try to make supporting materials available online that will help researchers uh, research their patriot ancestors. So speaking of organizations tied to Revolutionary War Service, another one is the Society of Cincinnati. And the reason I'm showing this website, because it's something that has really grown. Um, it wasn't that many years ago that for the Society of Cincinnati to access any of their records, you essentially had to go into Washington, D.C., and I have done that, and I have personally had the librarian pull records for me that I've had to look at, and this is regarding a New Jersey service at that time. I think it's DuPont Circle areas where it's located. Don't hold me to that. So don't cr send corrections to Connie that I gave the wrong location. Nice part <laughs> of DC. I just, I just want to, I'm trying to, you know, so I figure you would appreciate that. But what's been great is they are now digitizing some of these materials and they are unique materials. They are often one of a kind, um, especially in the manuscripts collection. So what you can see on this page is they have a maps collection. We love maps for Rev War, and that helps you with geography and context. But as far as researching our cert the service, the thing you want to really look at are manuscripts and bound manuscripts. Bound manuscripts just mean they are in a book format and manuscripts are just loose papers. But these are original documents, and when you typically have a ledger, I'll just use that word instead of saying bound manuscripts every time, when you have a ledger, or you have a, a, doc, a loose document, they weren't duplicated. You know, it's not like today or even years ago where you mimeographed them and scanned them and, you know, every place. There might be literally one copy, and that's what some of these are. So some of these are diaries, ship logs, um, just all kinds of paperwork related to those who served in the Revolutionary War or 
of the service during the Revolutionary War. So sometimes what you'll find in their collection are record books that were kept by orderlies in the army. So the army, and I don't know enough of, don't actually ask me too, too much about what an orderly did. I just want to put out there that I know they helped keep everything orderly. How's that? Do you like that? Um, but that they was. actually, but you know, they actually brought some order to the chaos during the war, but they would create these books that are documenting what transpired, you know, what happened. And so in a way, this is their diary of events of the time. Well, those diaries are great because they often talk about the various members of the unit that they're being an orderly for. Are they ill? Are they injured? Did they go off on leave? What adult, you know? So this is a, another resource for gaining insight into um, those ancestors who served and kind of a more personal perspective possibly on the nature of their service. There are very few orderly books that survive for North Carolina, so I've learned not to look for them. But I know that um, a, more of the service up in New York State, I've come across orderly books. And I, I like to look at them. I find them just really informative. And even if your ancestors not managed, you're just getting a bit more of a front row seat of what was happening in the course of the war occurring. Great resource. Thanks for the insight. No, it's it, like I said, it, I was so thrilled when I saw them do this because I knew they had a lot of hidden gems in that collection. So this is a great resource and it's very low key. As you can see, we're not talking fancy presentation and all of that. This is invaluable. The first thing I wanna tell you is that how I typically use this resource is that I actually come up, and I don't know if some of you are familiar with this. I, I know about this website. You can do a construct where I want to search on the last name Beckham. So I've put the last name Beckham here. And then I, instead of having HTTPS um, colon, you put site in front of it. Because this site is organized alphabetically, you can go down on it. But the reason why I do this, and so I hope you don't mind, I'm going to do this and then we'll come back to the site in a moment. That's fine. Because <laughs> what I want to show you is that by doing Beckham with that site, all, it's bringing up the Revolutionary War Pension files that have the name Beckham in it. And obviously what's great on this website is he's always put name variants. Notice Beckham, but Beckham without an H, Beckham spelled B-E-C-C-U-M, et cetera. Now we see all of these Beckhams, Beckham, 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 Beckham. We see Bickham, but what I wanna show you is something like this, Joel Darcy. What this says is his Revolutionary War pension mentions Abner Beckham. Okay. Oh, so great when I'm tip. okay, so say you're trying to determine service, and this applies a bit more to Society Cincinnati, whose webpage we we're just on, because we you have to really document service because your service has to be of an officer for 36 months, and there's a lot of rules for that. The pensions of those who served under this individual are invaluable because they provide information you don't have. It's not unusual that somebody may not have their own pension, like he does have his own pension. Many people didn't file for a pension. They died before they could file for a Revolutionary War pension. So your ancestor may not, he may have served as an officer, but he doesn't have a pension. He died in 1812. Was there any kind of, um, were, were widows allowed to collect uh, Revolutionary War pensions? The way to look at pensions is the federal government did as much as it could to not have to pay soldiers if it could get by with without doing so so Is it's a sliding change that don't you know <laughs> no no i was gonna say it should sound pretty familiar um and what would happen is that uh well that's how it and that's how it worked for the civil war I'm yeah. saying, every conflict you make your requirements so strict initially then you start relaxing them, but by then a large number of your pensioners have died, but also their widows. But yes, widows could apply. And that's the other thing that you'll find is there may be a pension, say Abner Beckham here, and I haven't looked at this one. 
well, says he, but what could have happened is if Abner was dead, it could be his wife filing the pension. So the pension's going to be listed under him. But she might say, I was married to him. I know he served. Here's five witnesses that can tell you he served, but I can't give you any details. So that's, again, where even if your ancestor has a pension, depending on the level of detail, you may want to search for somebody who served with your ancestor because right. he might provide details. Now, recognize that most pensions are going to focus on who served above them, so the colonels, the lieutenant colonels, the captains, the lieutenants, et cetera. But they will also mention sometimes if somebody was a substitute for somebody else, or they'll sometimes mention if they served with their extended family. And then the affidavits that are provided are often, um, in this case, it could be Bickhams and Beckhams. It could be in-laws. Mm -hmm. It could be neighbors. It could be community members, church members, et cetera. So it, it's, there's just a lot of neat information that can come out of it. But I like to do this back door as a way to see not if there's just a pension for my ancestor, but are there pensions that mention my ancestor? And that's one of the neat. So what they did is it's for the Southern campaigns. So this does not cover the Northern part of the Revolutionary War. It's um, definitely the Southern portion of it. So definitely a lot of uh, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and further South. If you were to go down this page, you can see that it's alphabetized by surname. So you can always click on a pension. And if I click on it, you're going to not go to the pension. These are all abstracts that were made of pens. But we already know that Family Search, Ancestry, and Fold 3 have the pension documents. So we have other places to look at the originals. These are great because somebody already went to the trouble of typing them, checking what the spelling was, and they will even include notes sometimes about who think the person was referencing. So like anything, I'd rather read a book transcript first, and then I say, go get the original. Because this won't have everything, but it does pull key details. And another resource on this website, and it's down that very same page, but I just searched on rosters for, with the page, and it's called the Southern Campaign Revolutionary War Unit rosters. You might remember we talked about rosters in some of the other websites. Rosters are neat because they're, they are now focusing typically on people serving under often colonels, or you're seeing here, colonels, lieutenant colonels, but sometimes captains. What do you know? Abner Bickham's right at the top. I wonder why I picked that name before. <laughs> it's actually, I've actually researched this guy, so that's what's just even funnier, I have researched uh, Abner's service quite a bit. But it's neat to see here that, you know, here's Georgia. He's, he's a captain, so it's not a high-level thing. And it's a company payroll for his militia company. Now, that number on the left-hand column that says B191, is that a roll number? What is that? So what this person has done is, again, these are abstracted. And where you can see is the B191 is the reference here. So this is probably referring to the National Archives um, reference. Because you will see what he's also excellent at. Notice this whole last paragraph is talking about exactly what publication M246 would be the microfilm, which record group it is, what roll number it is, and then down to the folder level. Man, so he always detail. gives you the, the yeah, he gives, well, he, he's putting you in a position that you can access the original without having to work too hard at it because you'll be able to use this information to get back to it. So again, what's nice about a roster is it just has a tendency to be a more focused list. Is going to have a tendency to focus at a, a particular unit that served. And that's nice because especially when you're talking militia units, as we are for Captain Abner Bickham, those militia units were normally created by people all living with a fairly small geographic area. So this can be a great way that you look at that and realize, gosh, I know these other five family names because the, my family family all intermarried with them. So it's just, it's a, just a different way of, instead of focusing just on the service of your ancestor, it, it kind of gives you the perspective of what does their um, fan club, their friends, associates, and neighbors look like um, through a military document. So true. You know, there's, you know, the 
North Carolina militia, and whether it was in the Civil War or in the, you know, these little militias, um, usually we're all neighbors or family members, you know, that are all within a few miles of each other. Yeah, and you know, and when you look at like these first few, which are Georgia, the thing that's going on is how many of those pe families from Georgia probably came from a North Carolina and possibly migrated from North Carolina into Georgia together. So that's gonna benefit your research even beyond Revolutionary War Service because that might actually help get you back to North Carolina, Virginia, or you know wherever they might have migrated from. Yeah, that's why uh, doing uh, research on the unit that the person served is important too because if half of a unit got wiped out in a battle, then a lot of times that half unit would join another partial unit and form a new unit. So it just kind of depends on the military service. But um, so tracing the, the history of the unit helps too. Yeah, and they're just, you know, and not a lot of those little lists survive. So they're precious. When, when you can find them because everybody had to serve in the militia typically from the age of 16 and on, but we're often uh, struggle, we often struggle to actually document that service because we can't find these little militia lists. Papers of the War Department. This is a neat little hidden resource. And what happens is just because the Revolutionary War ends in 1783, 1784, whatever date you sort of want to pick for it, payments were still being made. I mean, it's like in North Carolina, much of the action actually ended by 1781, but people are being paid in 1782, 83, 84, et cetera. And you have the War Department, which obviously would have overseen the Continental Army and related. And the War Department office was established just after the war in 1790. And it actually burned in 1800. So mo it had long been thought most of the records were destroyed, but with a lot of effort from a lot of people, what they have done is been able to find bits and pieces of these records and create this collection called the Papers of the War Department. And what you can find is that there's just all kinds of neat documents in here many of which are still related to the Revolutionary War and its immediate aftermath, and people trying to get paid for services they provided during the Revolutionary War, for example, that, you know, if they weren't applying to the state, but they wanted to apply to the federal government, et cetera. So this is just a place I just like to go look because it's kind of off the beaten path. You know, it's not, it's not created as a Revolutionary War service resource like some of the other things we've been looking at. This is created to try to recreate an archive of important uh, War Department documents in the immediate aftermath of the Re Revolutionary War. And so, and I have found people listed in here. You know, I have found people I am researching because they were making a claim, you know, and that's the thing to remember is we have a tendency nowadays that if you file a claim, okay, you would consider three to six months, an awfully long time for a claim to occur, right? You know, against an insurance company or something. I mean, nowadays it happens in often a month or so. You have to remember, we're still talking a period of time where things could take years or decades. So don't discount looking at later records, even when you're still looking for Revolutionary War Service. And this is kind of one of those resources. So this is a neat website. This is the individual effort of somebody called J.D. Lewis. It's called carolina.com. So its focus is on the two Carolinas, North Carolina and South Carolina. And this is an excellent resource for when you're looking for Revolutionary War Service for somebody who served in North Carolina, or South Carolina. I'd also Revolution. like to point out that Carolina is spelled Carolina. Yes. And that's the only way I always find his website easily as I, in a way, think about, I have to think about misspelling Carolina to call it Carolina. Yeah. And what is neat is his website, um, is, so you saw that main page, it's broken into the two states. Then for each of the two states, the, he has a bunch of other historically relevant information. So for North Carolina, he has some information about formation of 
um, the military districts, is information about some of the colonial history, et cetera. So do look at this if you're doing North or South Carolina research, but what I wanna focus on are his Revolutionary War pages. So he has the American Revolution in North Carolina, and you can see it's well used because it's a different color. The thing I focus on first is typically patriots and their forces. Interesting. I've been to this website uh, several times, but um, it's always fun to watch how other people research a page. So what happens is you have all known North Carolina ground troops. Do you remember those pensions we were just looking at on the other website? Yes. Which you can find the originals on other Fold3 Ancestry Family Search. But he, in essence, went through those roster roles, those pensions, and other documentation to put together what he considered to be a good summary of who served. So not just who served, but he also has other information on here about battles. But I'm focusing on people because we're talking about researching your Revolutionary War patriots. And then what he has done is if you click on any type of troop, you're going to do colonels. What you're going to find here is an alphabetical list by surname of colonels, the units they served in, so you can tell whether most of these happen to be militia units, but you also have state level troops, you also see continental troops. His estimate of when they serve from and to, and then notes on their service. And then if they participate in known battles, skirmishes, etc. So often, this is a place I will actually go first, <laughs> when I'm researching a Revolutionary War person from North Carolina, because he has pulled together this information. It's not perfect, it's not complete, but it gives you a place to start. And again, a lot of this is based on pensions. So I can then go to Fold3 and pull out the pensions or look for the abstracts, et cetera. But you can pretty quickly come in and go, hey, Martin Armstrong, Surrey County, wait a minute, my Martin Armstrong was from Surrey County. Could this be him? Okay, he's saying he served from here to here, and then he was a colonel in the militia, served to et cetera, and was in these battles. Now let me go figure out what that's based on. Does this guy have a pension? Or do other people mention this guy? Because he's a colonel, so he's gonna be mentioned in other people's paperwork. Did he leave a roster? Now, if he left a roster, did he sign the roster? I happen to notice that this guy is a Quaker. Doesn't say he's a Quaker, but I know he's a Quaker because he's with the New Garden uh, Meeting House, which is a Quaker yes. church. Yes. Well, that actually is where one of the bat one of the battles occurred near the New oh. Garden Meeting House. Oh, so he, so he may not have been a Quaker. He right. fought there. And, okay. and if, but in fact, you actually brought up a really good point, which is you're typically unlikely to find a Quaker serving in the Revolutionary War so um, because because their, um, their position of being pacifists, they would go so far to the point of not taking the oath of allegiance often required at this time. And because of that, they would have to pay tax penalties sometimes. Um, so to basically say, if you're not gonna be serving, then you're gonna be supporting those that are serving. This does not mean that people who were Quakers did not serve. And if you look, look through Quaker records, you'll sometimes find that they did serve and then were in essence kicked out of being a Quaker. They were dismissed, to use the Quaker, the friend's language. They were then dismissed because they did participate in the, they felt it was important to participate in the Revolutionary War. And as a result, were then dismissed from being a Quaker. Same goes for the Civil War. I have Quaker ancestors who bought their way out of serving in the Civil War. They paid, and, and in some cases they were uh, serving in the aspect of providing uh, wagons and horses and, you know, support for the uh, Civil War, but we're talking about Revolutionary War, so we'll get back to that. But, but, but it's the same thing, because in Revolutionary War, people could 
uh, pay for a substitute or what you'll sometimes find 15 people might pay for a substitute and that information comes out in those pension paperwork we talked about because somebody will say they will say in their uh, in certain paperwork yes you know I paid for this person to be a substitute or the soldier will say I was paid as a substitute by and they'll list out whoever paid for them to be a substitute so again that's why these records are not just always for the person you're directly researching they reflect a community at the time. And these, uh, again, um, an opportunity for Quakers to not serve, which was against their faith, they could then hire a substitute um, to I do that. I didn't mean to get off on a rabbit hole there, but. No, uh. <laughs> no hey, you know, oh gosh, we, we wouldn't be genealogists if we didn't do rabbit holes. Let's, yeah, right? let's be, uh, and so I've just showed you a little bit of the North Carolina page and just recognize that He's also created a similar page for the American Revolution in South Carolina, and it too has a page about patriots and forces. And you'll, you'll kind of navigate it the same way, that you can look at um, battles and skirmishes, or, but again, if we're, if we're focusing on individuals, we're going to start with patriots and their forces. It will be an alphabetical list by whatever level the person served at. And again, you can always search outside of his um website because we you by recognizing again that you can do the site you know what i showed you all before that you can sure. put um site colon and then just put a surname and then see where it shows up across this website because you may not know that your person was a colonel versus a captain but if you search on the surname, then you could get taken directly to a page and go, okay, I see that name serving as a captain. So that might be my person type thing. I think that tip is worth the price of admission right there. What, what we're doing is we're using the stronger search engine to give us great insight into a website. So instead of having to be linear through a website or guessing, I like to work from the outside in sometimes because I can just more effectively and efficiently get to the information I want. But again, he's, he's created a great website. So I want to spend one more brief moment and talk about another loyalist resource. Um, because again, you know, a lot of what we're talking about does focus on patriots. They are the records we have the greatest and easiest access to. Obviously, they are the people who supported what is now the United States of America. And again, it's sometimes a gray line between being a patriot, patriot and a loyalist. So there are some loyalist resources. I've already pointed to um, some of them on the Ancestry website. And here you actually have the Online Institute for Advanced Loyalist Studies. So I love it. It's Online Loyalist. So what it is, is it just has a bunch of resources here and it does support genealogists and, you know, trying to identify who are loyalists. It has some online resources related to identifying loyalists and documenting them. Um, so I do recommend uh, checking this website out if you do think that there are loyalists in your family tree. Great tips. Gosh, I'm loving all this good resource, where to find records online kind of stuff. And this, I just wanted to kind of end with um, this. This is Cindy's list. Many of you may be familiar with her. Um, she has extensive categories of information. And one of the categories that she has is US military and American Revolution. And I, I put this here because what we've talked about till now has really focused on um, records, you know, trying to identify our ancestors who served in the Revolutionary War, whether they were a patriot or a loyalist. And what this does is it goes to that next level and a bit broader. So a lot of the resources we have available to us that we have talked about have focused also more on those serving in what the army. Well, she has a section here that also talks about navies and ships because you do have a naval component, those records were kept separate from the, um, the army component. It, the Navy was not as big in some regards at that time, but it still existed and people still served. The Navy is often a place too where it would not be unusual to find um, free purse color or even possibly those enslaved serving, which ties back to the DAR book, The Forgotten Patriots because there's a long maritime heritage of free persons of color and enslaved working on ships. 
Um, so this would be another opportunity to pursue those ancestors who served. But it also just talks about libraries and archives, um, publications, where records are. We've obviously talked about some of them in terms of military and pension, but this also talks about burial records and some other things. It, groups you could participate in. So this is kind of that next level that either you have found your ancestor and you want to know more about a unit they served in, or you want to know more about the battles they were in, et cetera, or you've not yet really found them. And so you want to learn more of the historical context for the area where they live to find out, well, if people served, what was going on and how might they have participated? <laughs> uh, so you have a handout. Thank you so much for putting that together. Um, and I know that, you know, that's just really helpful <laughs> for everybody to have those links on hand. And, and I think all of those links that we talked about today will be in that handout and I will make that freely available. Uh, so if people want to find out more about you, where do they do that? Well, um, basically, best places is my main website, and then I have a second website, as you know. So the main website is uh, www.mosaicrpm.com. Uh, it's based on Mosaic Research and Project Management, the name of my business. And on that, um, there's all kinds of contact me buttons, information about articles I've written, some articles I have written, sometimes upcoming talks, you know, whatever I can, I, I put on there. So, um, and then the other website is for what's called Tar Heel Discoveries, which is www.tarheeldiscoveries.com, uh, which is a one week program that we're supposed to offer for the third time in April. And, um, <laughs> you notice the supposed to, um, but that's what it is. The archives were closed and uh, we hold, it's a program that's held in um, the State Archives of North Carolina and State Library building. And since it was closed, we couldn't hold the program. So we might be looking to offer it again, but we have to wait till the archives open. But that's a, a one week mix of on hands research and lectures. Uh, for participants uh, with a focus on researching North Carolinians. While the majority of people are going to be watching this, you know, around the summertime of 2020, those who may be watching it three years from now, they're going, what is she talking about? It's the COVID-19 uh, shutdown that she's referring <laughs> to that has caused her workshops to stop. So if anybody is watching this yes. <laughs> way off in the future, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> that, that's right. It is. We hope an art, artifact and we hope that uh, it won't be driving our lives quite the same way in 2021 as it has at this point. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. We learned oh, something. So, so sweet. No, I, again, thanks for the opportunity. It's just always fun to share some of the things that rattle around in my brain with others. So maybe it'll <laughs> rattle around in their brain for a while and, you know, and it might actually help somebody. So I hope it does. Well, you are welcome back anytime. Anytime you just feel like you have the need to rattle off again, <laughs> come on back because we'll take it. Well, if you missed part one, it's on the screen for you now. Now, the link for the handout is in the description below this video or at genealogytv.org in the blog post for this episode. Thank you, Diane Richard, for the handout and the time it took to put this together. I really appreciate it. Now, it is time for you to go find your Revolutionary War ancestors. So until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.